Today we're going to introduce you to the playwright William Shakespeare and his play, The Tragedy of Julius Caesar. A few biographical information pieces about Shakespeare. His parents' names were John and Mary, and he married Anne Hathaway when he was very young in November of 1582. Now, Shakespeare and Anne would have three children, Susanna, Hamnet, and Judith. And as you can see from our picture, they've actually remade Shakespeare's birthplace. So you can see an example of what his house might have looked like where he grew up. So sometime in the 1580s, the bard, or William Shakespeare, left his family in Stratford-upon-Avon to pursue a career as a playwright, a poet, and an actor in London. His success was immense. Shakespeare is known to have written 154 sonnets and 37 plays. In fact, so prolific was Shakespeare as a writer of sonnets that a sonnet form has been named for him. The Shakespearean sonnet is 14 lines long with a rhyme scheme, and those end rhymes end with an ABAB pattern for the first quatrain, a CDCD pattern in the second quatrain, EF, EF rhythmic pat uh, rhyme pattern in the third quatrain, and the last couplet, lines 13 and 14, have a GG and rhyme pattern. We have a picture of the Globe Theater for you to look at. It is a remake. Once again, the original is not there. But the Globe Theater, also known as the Shakespeare Globe Theater, was not only one of the most famous playhouses of all time, but the playhouse where Shakespeare performed many of his greatest plays. Built from oak, deal, and stolen playhouse frames, the three-story, 3,000-capacity 3, Globe Theater, co-owned by William Shakespeare, has become almost as famous as the playwright himself. Now, the show lasted about two and a half hours, usually in the open-air theaters and during the afternoon. Uh, as you saw from the previous picture of the Globe Theater, it is open in the middle to let the sunlight in. That's how they would light the stage. There were no acts written in, but frequent intermissions. So I know when you read the tragedy of Julius Caesar or other Shakespearean plays, there are acts written in, but originally there were none. There was no scenery, but elaborate props and costumes to give reality. Again, you wouldn't have sets or scenes being put up for the, for the viewers to enjoy, but you would see, like say, if there is a battle scene in Julius Caesar, the actors might be going through a sword fight and carrying swords. You might see the women carrying handkerchiefs. And devices such as trap doors and scaffolds were used to make gods, witches, or other supernatural people appear and disappear. Uh, again, you're going to see a ghost in Act 5 of the tragedy of Julius Caesar, and they would usually use trap doors in order to have the actor enter and leave in a different manner than the usual actors. There were no actresses in the time of Shakespeare. Women actors would have been considered immoral. So therefore, all the parts that are women are played by men or boys. There were no programs to hand out. Not everybody would have been literate enough to read one anyway. And the people who are going to Shakespearean plays usually already knew the entire story. If they were going to go watch the tragedy of Julius Caesar, they likely already knew the story about Caesar and Brutus and everyone in the story. The closeness of stage to the audience led to the use of asides and soliloquies, and the front of the stage was a big open area where the penny public, otherwise known as the groundlings, stood to watch as they could not afford seats. Speaking of asides and soliloquies and metaphors, a few points on Shakespeare's style. A lot of metaphors are used throughout Shakespearean plays. And that is comparing something in terms of something else. For example, he might say in Julius Caesar's play that lowliness is young ambition's ladder. Now, because of the closeness of the audience to the stage, a lot of times his actors would use soliloquies, which are usually longer speeches given by the characters when they're alone on the stage, such as if we would imagine being the viewer in the audience, a person talking to himself out loud. They would also use asides, and that's when a character says something directly to the audience, but the other characters who are on the stage cannot hear it, kind of like them muttering to themselves, so we in the audience know what the person is thinking. 
He also used a lot of sonnets in his plays. Remember, Shakespeare wrote 154 of them, usually when the theaters were closed because of illness in the town. Now, a sonnet is a very rigid poetic style of writing, 14 lines consisting of three sets of four-line quatrains and then a two-line rhyming couplet at the end. He also used quite a few puns. Remember, people were going to the place for entertainment purposes. They didn't have TVs and movies and other things back then. This was their television set. And so puns are humorous plays on words that could indicate different meanings. For example, in the tragedy of Julius Caesar, in Act 1, you're going to see a man by the name of the cobbler say, A trade, sir, that I hope I may use with a safe conscience, which is indeed a mender of bad souls. Now, a cobber, cobbler mends shoes. He's also perhaps talking about his conscience or his soul, S-O-U-L, a spirit. So let's go ahead and introduce you to the tragedy of Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare. Now, the setting of this play, because it is about Julius Caesar, is set in ancient Rome. Shakespeare is now going to create a world full of political intrigue, magical occurrences, and with Julius Caesar, military conquest. So the setting of Julius Caesar is largely set in Rome in February of the year 44 BC. Now in later scenes, in later acts, the action is going to move to Sardis and the battlefield at Philippi. Now the physical landmarks of ancient Rome, such as the Tiber River, the Capitol, and the House of the Senate, are referred to with great frequency. Remember, we don't have scenes and sets on the actual stage in Shakespeare's time, so you need the actors to remind us where they are. The Forum is also the setting for an important scene. Roman political institutions and officials, such as tribunes, senators, patricians, and priests, are always present there. So who was Caesar? Well, at one time he was the most powerful man in Rome, and in our story he has recently returned to the city after months of fighting abroad. At the time, at the beginning of your play, Caesar was fighting Pompey and another powerful Roman and both of his Pompey's sons. Now Pompey, as well as others in the Roman Senate, were disturbed by Caesar's growing ambition. Their fears seem to be valid when Caesar refuses to enter Rome as an ordinary citizen after the war. Instead, he marches his army on Rome and takes over the government. But the people don't mind. The lower class working people actually love Caesar. Matter of fact, they make him a ruler or a dictator, a position that was sometimes granted for a tenure term or for the rest of their lives. Of course, the upper class, the other ruling party, the people who still wanted power, the senators, resent Caesar for having so much power. Therefore, some senators are going to begin to conspire against Caesar. Brutus, Caesar's friend who believes that he must act against Caesar for the good of Rome. Casca, who hates the ordinary citizens of Rome, yet is jealous because they're in love with Caesar and not with him and Cassius, a greedy and jealous man who wants to take dramatic measures to keep Caesar from winning any more power and to take away any power that Caesar has previously had. Because this is set in ancient Rome, Shakespeare's going to use Roman customs and their superstitions to create these spooky conditions and atmosphere to mirror the dangerous plot that's being planned. So the Romans believed that omens could reveal the future, and these omens could take the form of unusual weather, flights of birds, or other natural phenomena. And we're going to see this happening even in Act 1, when there is terrible weather in Act 1, Scene 3. You're going to have Julius Caesar also ask uh, his priests to make sacrifice to the gods. There's some supernatural powers that the, the Romans really believed in, and Shakespeare's going to use them for entertainment purposes. So when we have the priests making a sacrifice, they thought that animals were seen as indicators of the future. Now, the Romans often sacrificed animals to their gods and had their entrails or their guts examined by an official called a heraspex. 
any abnormalities or imperfections indicated the anger of a god or a particularly bad event was about to happen. Now, unusual astronomical and met meteorological occurrences were also seen as signs of future events. Solar eclipses were believed to foreshadow doom, as was lightning. Now, when we look at the elements of fiction, when we look at the five acts of the Shakespearean tragedy, in Act One, just like you would in any other play, you need to have your exposition. The characters need to be introduced. The setting needs to be introduced. So there's a lot of time in Act One taken up for us to be introduced to all of the characters of the play. In Act Two, we've not only seen the conflict happen in Act One, but in Act Two, that conflict is going to grow. We're going to introduce the major conflicts and all of the minor storylines. Act three is where the climax of the turning point usually happens. Now in a tragedy, things usually go from bad in act two to worse in act three. The following action happens in act four, and that would be a conflict resolution that begins to fall into place. And that's from the result of the climax. You've had a turning point in act three that you cannot go back to. So they have to move ahead. And so conflict begins to resolve. Your denouement or main conflicts completely being resolved happen in Act 5. Now in Act 5 in a tragedy, this includes a catastrophe, another climactic turning point in the storyline. In a Shakespearean tragedy, usually that means one or more of your major characters have got to die. When we look at the mood or the tone of the tragedy of Julius Caesar, it's one of impending doom and catastrophe. From the beginning, danger lurk lurks in every corner. Friends can no longer be trusted as they turn to manipulation and conspiracy and plot their next moves. Images of violence, blood, and death dominate the visual texture of the play. The weighty political intrigue is always present throughout the drama. And the latter half of the play even assumes an eerie mood with the appearance of Caesar's ghost returning to seek revenge. The closing phase of the play is dominated by the sinister image of the sword and what it can do. So we look at our characters. Let's start with our namesake, the tragedy of Julius Caesar. Now, he's known to be physically weak. He has several different infirmities. You'll hear some of these senators, such as Brutus, actually talk about some of these weaknesses. He's also known as a tyrant. Caesar's had Morellus and Flavius, who we meet in Act 1, Scene 1, arrested. He's superstitious. He believes in importance and dreams. His wife, when she starts having dreams, nightmares about him, he wants to listen to them. He goes to the priests and, have, and has them sacrifice an animal to the gods. He wants to know what other people are thinking, and, and he is very indecisive about these dreams. Matter of fact, he can't make up his mind at all whether or not to even go to the Senate. However, even though he is quite indecisive and superstitious, he thinks himself perfect and decisive, and therefore he's going to be stubborn and inflexible. Now, if we place Julius Caesar as our protagonist, we can call him an arrogant soldier and an ambitious politician. He believes that he is perfect, that he is infallible. After his great victory over the sons of Pompey, he believes that he's worthy of more power than just being the head of Rome. He wants to be crowned the leader of the entire Roman Empire. There are a lot of antagonists in this play. Caesar's antagonists are Brutus, Cassius, and the other conspirators who do not want him to become the head of the Roman Empire. They plot to overthrow Caesar and assassinate him outside the capital. He's an easy target because of his fatal flaw. His extreme pride makes him trust them and want to be with these senators. Many times Caesar is nearly saved by omens and warnings, but he disregards all of them, thinking himself as infallible. He's so proud that he's easily flattered, leading him to think less strategically and placing himself in grave danger. Another character of the story we have is Brutus. 
He is of noble heritage. He's a Roman nobleman, as was his father. Now, Brutus truly believes that his role in the assassination is for the good of Rome. He sincerely believes that if Caesar is taken out, that the people of Rome will appreciate it, that he's doing it for their own good. Afterwards, when he's riven, driven out of Rome, because of his noble heritage, you would think he would have lots of money and lots of support, and he doesn't. But in order for him to survive, he's too honest. He won't take bribes from people after the effect. He's naive. He believes in the essential goodness of those around him. He can't believe that there would be senators out there who would want Caesar's power for themselves. And of course, Brutus is philosophical. His philosophies are going to guide his actions and decisions. Again, he's truly believing what he's doing is for the good of the Roman people. He's not seeking power. He's not seeking to kill his friend Caesar because he wants to be Caesar. He's doing it for what he thinks is the good democracy of Rome. Cassius, however, is another story. He's envious. Cassius has contempt for Caesar and envies Caesar's position, even wants it for himself. Cassius is also afraid that Caesar has ambitions to be king, and he fears what might become of Rome in such an instance. Now, being a senator, he is politically astute. He advises Brutus to assassinate Antony along with Caesar, understanding what can happen. He also advises Brutus not to allow Antony to speak at Caesar's funeral. He is certainly corrupt, unlike being honest Brutus. Cassius is corrupt. Prior to the battle at Philippi, he's accused by Brutus of taking bribes. But he is a good military strategist. His battle plan for Philippi is well thought out and based on sound military principles. Now, Mark Antony is another senator and soldier. He is one of the young generals for Julius Caesar and he's very loyal to Caesar. He loved and admired Caesar. He's quite clever. He pretends to befriend the conspirators and asks that he be allowed to speak at Caesar's funeral. And of course, he wants to speak because he's a very skilled orator. Antony's speech at Caesar's funeral sways the crowd into what he wants. Now, he's also a very hard leader. Antony's role in condemning men to death shows he can be as cold-hearted as he can be passionate. And he hasn't gotten to be a young general for nothing. He is a very skilled military leader. He has an equal voice in planning the war against the legions of Brutus and Cassius. So when we talk about all this sense of power and corruption, that has to be a major theme in the tragedy of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar has a theme of misused power as a corruptive force. Now this is seen in the fact that Caesar is a dictator suspected of being tyrannous, and that Cassius is so power hungry that he assassinates Caesar, hoping to become more powerful himself, and that Antony, Octavius, and Lepidus become a dictatorial and tyrannical triumvirate, which was worse than Caesar ever hinted at being. There will be other minor themes that you might notice throughout the play. For example, the idea of being loyal the idea of friendship uh, between Brutus and Cassius, between Brutus and Caesar, between Antony and Caesar. The evils of pride, conspiracy, and anarchy about power comes around this sense of corruption. And so when we have this conspiratorship coming in about Brutus and Cassius wanting to kill Caesar, they bring in other people who want to have that sense of power, but they also bring in that sense of anarchy with them. And of course, Caesar's sense of pride, he has no idea this is coming. The logic of political order, we don't really get to see anybody being a good leader for, or effective leader for long. As soon as power is taken away, power is immediately given to someone else and they stretch it as far as they can to see how much absolute power they can have. And then finally, we look at the viability of republicanism as a form of government. When we start the play, Already the senators in the forum are meeting because they're afraid that Caesar's going to take away their sense of, of form, the, their sense of power and control. And so when we have the people uh, wanting Caesar to take over as their leader, there's this sense of who is really in charge. People don't really know who's in charge or who they want to be in charge. Everybody certainly loves Caesar. 
except for the others who are in charge, like Brutus and Cassius and the other senators. Well, that'll do for the tragedy of Julius Caesar and for our introduction with William Shakespeare. Thank you so much for stopping by. If you'd like to learn more about the tragedy of Julius Caesar, please leave some comments down below. Let me know if you'd like me to go through the acts. And as always, I'd appreciate it if you subscribed.